amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me for i once was lost but now i'm found i was blind
amazing grace. Let me sing it one more time. My chains are gone, for I've been set, set free. free. My God, God my, my Savior, Savior has ransomed me. Amazing grace. And we do come to this place today to thank God once more for that amazing grace. That wonderful grace, favor of God that we could never merit, that we do not deserve. But in His grace, He saved us. In His grace, He made a place for us. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord God. We give you the honor, the glory, the praise. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah to the mighty God. We give you the praise and the honor and glory. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. My chains are gone. I've been saved. God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you, Lord. 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 Amen, amen, amen. The Bible says His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. Welcome to this uh, time together in the Word of the Lord, Sunday school, 45 minutes of getting right into the Word today. While our children, young people, different ones are in classes as well. Praise the Lord. Still getting used to this new schedule. Got some bugs to be worked out. But uh, just bear with us. We welcome all that are watching us online as well. God bless you. If you have your Bibles, I direct you to Romans, the third chapter. Romans chapter number three. Amen. Good to have Sister Jillian home with us today. Amen. Amen. I think some other college students will be here this week. Praise God. <laughs> Romans chapter number 3, we're going to read, beginning with uh, the 20th verse, down through verse number 26. Romans chapter number 3, beginning with the 20th verse, down through verse number 26. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Verse number 23, let's all read this out loud together. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We'll continue on, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and everyone say the justifier. The justifier. The justifier of him or everyone which believeth in Jesus. Hallelujah. That justification comes as we believe on Jesus. Amen. And uh, let's just ask the Lord's blessing upon today's teaching of his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the opportunity to look at it, God, and study the doctrine. We pray, God, that you would help us today. God, to receive from you is our desire. 
in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. 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 Good to see you. God bless you. You may be seated. If you've been following us online, you know that uh, we have begun a special series on membership, the four pillars of membership. And the four pillars are behind me there, thanks to Sister Tammy Bowski. And we've been looking at the first pillar, the principles of doctrine. Everyone say doctrine. Amen. And then we'll move in a few weeks to the priorities of giftings, the perfecting of holiness, and participation in stewardship. I believe that these four pillars will help one truly recognize what it means to, to become a, uh, a member of First Apostolic Church, amen, and uh, how to participate in agreement with the church. Uh, again, as we've mentioned in the, uh, these uh, lessons we've already had, uh, you don't have to be a member to come to First Apostolic Church, but uh, we do encourage membership. Membership is a statement that you make, that you are aligning uh, with this church, with its doctrine, uh, as closely as possible. When you walked in today, you should have received some uh, little handouts, and uh, these things you would have received if we had the opportunity to be together uh, these past few weeks, but uh, due to uh, sickness and so forth, we didn't. But uh, these are very good little tracks. And uh, we spoke last week about the oneness of God. If you didn't get one of these, our ushers can make sure you get one. Uh, raise your hand. The oneness of God. And then this one here, um, this Apostolic Doctrine Reference Guide. If you look on the back, uh, it's got something called Apostolic Avenue. Apostolic Avenue. And there's 16 things there. And uh, this is a general outline of the plan of God for man. This is something that you would want to have in your Bible. Uh, if you've got a Bible this size, I know a lot of people carry smaller Bibles, and that's, uh, that's fine. Uh, it won't fit on your phone, so you'll want to put it in your paper Bible. But uh, these things we're going to draw from over uh, the course of the, the next uh, many weeks or so as we go through this special series. And so from time to time, I'll say, hey, if you have your apostolic avenue or apostolic doctrine reference guide. So bring this with you because these things, uh, we, we can't just buy them and then uh, copy, uh, they're copyrighted, so we don't print these ourselves. Uh, but we do have to purchase them, and so if you don't have one uh, with you, you may miss out. And uh, uh, So bring those with you. I think it'll be a big blessing to your personal study. The Bible says to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Uh, I've only got 30 minutes here. I will see how far we get into today's lesson, which is going to uh, be a simply defining the gospel. Amen. It's very important for us to agree on what's the gospel. We can't have three or four or five different ideas of how a person gets saved. Uh, in, our, in our world, in Christianity, you can find multiple different viewpoints on how somebody says to be saved. As simply as walk down and sign a line on a church uh, book somewhere and you're saved. Or uh, I even heard of a church one time that the, the pastor said, if you shake my hand, you will be saved. Well, friend, there's nowhere in Scripture where it says find the right pastor's hand to shake and you'll be saved. Amen. The Bible gives us. Amen. I believe some definitive things for how we can be saved. Uh, some people say, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Well, that's a scripture and it is true because you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before anything else has any power to it at all. If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't believe that he is the Savior of the world, then uh, you, you can't receive from him salvation. Amen. Our repentance will be uh, will not be as as it could be without faith that He can forgive sins. Our water baptism uh, will not be efficacious because we will not believe that He's removing our sin, and uh, we won't receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost because you cannot receive the Spirit of God without faith uh, in the Lord. And so it does begin with faith. But some people say, "Well, all you need is faith. Just believe." and uh, nothing else happens. Well, if that was the truth, then why is there 
not clear scripture. I mean, there's, you, have to, you have to throw away so many clear scripture uh, to, to just say all it takes is a little belief. Amen. Romans chapter number 3, verse number 23, lets us know salvation is necessary because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. God's grace that we just sang about, amen, the amazing grace, is, is often defined like this, God's favor presented to us without merit, the unmerited favor of God, unearned favor of God. None of us deserve grace. Grace is God's gift to us. Amen. It was grace that caused my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. Amen. And uh, so if God was not showing us grace, there would be no plan for salvation. God is merciful. Amen. He shows mercy unto us, which is a type of pity. Amen. He pities our condition. He looks upon us realizing that he did not make us to be bound in sin. He did not make us to be in in chains uh, uh, forever, but he wants to mercifully forgive us. And in his mercy, uh, we know that he did come to seek and to save the lost. Amen. And so we, we look at uh, this need of faith, which is followed then in obedience to, uh, and we're going to study this uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and other verses of Scripture. Uh, faith leads naturally to repentance. Uh, faith leads naturally to water baptism, and then faith is that which helps us receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what does repentance mean? When we talk about repentance and we say that uh, to believe uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of one's sins is necessary. Well, uh, Webster's Dictionary defines repentance as feeling uh, a sense of sorrow and self-reproach for what one has done or didn't do. Now, the Greek definition of repentance, the Greek word for repentance, literally is metanoiu, metanoiu, which means to change one's mind. When you repent, you are making a change that begins uh, not in your emotional, but really in your logical, rational side. You can have feelings of sorrow for sin, but true repentance is more than just feeling sorrowful, crying a few tears, and then getting up and going right back to that pig pen. Amen. It's more than just saying, well, I, I want to be better. You know, there's a whole lot of people today that want to talk about how broken they are, but they don't want to get better. They just kind of like the, 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 like to say they're broken. I'm just, I'm just so messed up. Well, God wants to fix you. Amen. He wants to give you hope. He wants to change your life. You don't have to sit there with an identity of being just miserably broken and messed up and I'll never, ever change and I'm always going to be this way. Friend, that's a slap in the face of God when we say that even God can't change my life. But you and I write repentance. We say, okay, I'm turning away from that attitude and I'm turning to the Lord to see what He offers for me. There's biblical examples of repentance, and one of them that uh, we'll highlight today, or two of them, but the first one is Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh was an ungodly city that was uh, uh, destined to be judged, and there was a prophet by the name of Jonah. Remember Jonah, and um, uh, we find in Jonah chapter number 3 and uh, verses 5 through 10, the story, a little bit of the story uh, of what happened here. So Jonah, if you recall, he was sent to Nineveh. He decided to go to Tarshish. He was on the boat in the middle of the sea, and a uh, storm came up, and he put two and two together and realized, hey, I'm the cause of this storm. My disobedience is what's brought us here. He told the guys, throw me overboard. If you throw me overboard and you let me, da you let me drown, the sea is going to calm. Everything is going to be okay for you. Well, they didn't want to do it, but they didn't want to die. And after he you know, continued to uh, uh, push this, they did throw him overboard. And what happened? God had de designed a great fish, and uh, this great fish swallowed Jonah and uh, took him where he was supposed to go, and he ended up in Nineveh, and uh, he came preaching to Nineveh. They got it up on the, uh, the screen there. Just keep it up. We'll go down through these verses. Oh, he came preaching 
and, and Nineveh did what Jonah didn't believe would happen. And that is the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth, which was a type of, of a rough garment that was signaling they, they were in a frame of mind uh, that they knew they were worthy of judgment and they wanted to repent from the greatest of them even to the least of them. So they're fasting, they're wearing sackcloth, and uh, even the king arose from his throne. He laid off his robes, covered himself with sackcloth, set in ashes, and, um, and declared uh, this decree that uh, no man nor beast uh, would eat anything, drink any water, uh, that everything would be covered with sackcloth, and everybody would cry out unto God and let them turn from their evil ways and from the violence that's in their hands, and then he asks, he says this question. He says, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Who can tell it? Who, what if it would happen this way, that God would change his mind, repent, that he would change his mind, and if you know the story, he does change his mind, and he spares Nineveh. Amen. And so when they heard Jonah's preaching, they fasted, they turned from their evil ways, they turned from the violence, they were a very violent people, uh, and uh, then they repented. Uh, another example is Israel in Isaiah chapter number 55, verses 6 through 7. The Lord says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Okay, repentance is, is a change of mind. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. To God, he will abundantly pardon. Who does the pardoning? God. God offers an abundant pardon. He doesn't offer a probation. He offers a pardon. Amen. He gives you a full pardon when you repent. He removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. Amen. He is a God that fully pardons. What do we have to do Verses in, in, in this verse, Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7? We've got to seek the Lord and call upon his name. Hallelujah. Repentance is not just me trying to fix myself. Repentance is me saying, God, I need you. I'm seeking you. The Lord knows the plan. He knows the step-by-step -step process, how to get you fixed, how to get you whole. Amen. It may be different than what exactly happens to your spouse or your neighbor, but you seek the Lord, call upon Him, let the wicked forsake His way. All right? We can't repent and stay in our wickedness. We've got to forsake wickedness. If you want to be saved, you have to forsake wickedness. You can't hold to the good and the evil Amen. You've got to let go of your wickedness. And you need to ask yourself, are, am I wicked? Do I do wicked things? And many of us, before we were saved, could say we did so. Whether we would put ourselves in the category of an evil person or not, we were all worthy of death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The unrighteous need to forsake his thoughts. We've got the wrong thoughts in our mind. It's uh, we, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, our thoughts uh, lead us astray, and we've got to learn how to forsake those thoughts, turn away from those evil thoughts, and return to the Lord. Amen. And the Bible says when we do that, verse number 7, at the end there, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God he will abundantly pardon. And I'm thankful uh, for that today. New Testament teaching on repentance, we are going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 11, and you're going to see here seven works of repentance, seven works of repentance, and uh, verse number 11 there, if you can, if you can read it, for behold this selfsame thing that ye are sorrowing after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Amen. These works of repentance. Amen. It's not just saying, okay, God, I'm sorry, and then thinking, okay, that's all I needed to do. 
Well, it begins with the sorrowful, amen, uh, 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 heart. But then it goes on to looking at how sin has brought so much uh, problems in one's life. Amen. Sin is not just some little, uh, you know, little small, un, uh, 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 unnecessary or, uh, you know, a little, little, little thing. No, it is, it's a big thing. It works in your life in so many ways. And Paul is telling the church in Corinthians that after they sorrowed, they, they were careful. They, they had a, a real sense of care about the sin that they had been allowing in their life. They, they had this watchfulness. All right? Uh, you repent of your sins, you've got to stay on guard. That watchfulness there, that, that's a reference to having a watchman on the wall. When they had uh, their cities built with walls, they would put security watchmen up on the wall. And these individuals were the ones that, that uh, would sound the alarm when they would see the enemy coming or some sort of, of a problem that was there. And uh, that's the same thing. When repentance is sincere in your life, it'll create a watchfulness in your life. You'll be careful uh, about what you do, what you used to do. You won't do that anymore. And if you fall into that sin, you'll be repentant. Amen. He goes on to say, what clearing, what clearing of yourself. You, you wanted to get this separated from you. You wanted to remove this from you. Amen. You wanted to make things right. Real repentance will make you say, I'm sorry to the people that you've been wounding. Real repentance, amen, will, will cause you to want to try uh, to pay your debts that you owe to people and to society. You, you want to you have a clean slate, amen, because God forgives us. We want then to, to take that forgiveness that we've received and let it be extended to other people. Let me give you an example. Say you robbed a bank. You got the money there in your, in your little briefcase and then you feel a twinge of guilt. And so you say, God, I'm sorry. I know I sinned, and I know I'm not supposed to rob the bank. And so I'm just letting you know I'm sorry I did it. I, I got my reasons, and, uh, and then keep the money. You think that's repentance? No, it's not repentance. That's just saying, okay, can I get this fixed somehow so you, like, you know, erase what I did, but I get to keep what I did? You know? God, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I... I've been paying attention to, to, to that, uh, that, that wrong material. I, I've been paying attention to that wrong person. I've been doing things I shouldn't have done, but I, I'm just letting you know I feel bad that I do the things that I do. It's not just that. It's not just about feeling bad that you're still doing things that you know you shouldn't do. No, it's about clearing yourself of that guilt. Getting it out of your life. Indignation then rises up within you. The things I once loved, I now hate. And the things I once hated, I now love. That's the indignation that rises up. That hatred of sin. You know you're getting deep into the walk of, uh, uh, walk of God, this repentance walk, when the things that used to attract you now repel you. And you don't want to see yourself there anymore. You don't want to even recognize that, that that used to be me. Thank God. Amen. Thank God you're not who you used to be. Thank God. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the biggest things that bothers me as pastors is when I begin to talk to people that have been uh, repentant and saved, but they want to talk about their past, and they want to talk about, oh, what they used to do. And they'll tell you, well, I used to do this, I used to do that. And you almost get this, you know, almost get this sense that they kind of enjoy remembering those days. Amen. They, the, the Bible says the dog returns to its vomit. The pig returns to its pig pen. The Christians should not even allow their mind to go back to those places. We shouldn't speak of those things. Amen. There, there ought to be some things left unsaid. Amen. And uh, you'll say, you know what? I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad the Lord found me. I'm so glad he saved me. And, and, and really, I just, I just kind of wish none of you even knew what I used to do. I really, I, I don't have pictures of myself as I used to look. I, I don't have stories to tell you of what I used to do. Oh, you can bring certain things up in your testimony. You see what I'm saying? 
But the difference is, is that some people, they, they like to wallow in that. And they like to just kind of revisit that for a while. Oh, the parties I used to go to. Oh, the th drugs I used to take. Oh, the immorality that I used to indulge myself in. God help us. God help us to have a hatred for sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin will destroy you. Sin will send you to the lake of fire. Amen. That thing that you think is just a, you know, a little deal. A no, sin will kill your soul. It will destroy you. So we you hate it. Until you get to the point where you hate sin. Amen. And uh, Paul said it like this. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall separate me from this? He said, I, I, and, and this is the Apostle Paul. And again, you know, we're, none of us are going to be sinless. But, friend, you and I better be closer to the holiness and righteousness of God today than we were yesterday. I mean, we can't just keep slipping up the same things all the time. Over and over and over again, eventually you need to realize that's signaling something to you. And that is you ain't tired of sin yet. You're not tired of the world yet. You're not done yet. You're just trying to hold on to this, this grace and think I can, I can stay here and also here. And it don't work. It don't work. We got to have a hatred for sin. The fear of God better rise in our lives. Amen. God will teach you how to fear Him if you'll allow Him. Amen. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We need to have such a high reverence for God and pleasing God and knowing that, that He alone is the forgiver of sins. He only can forgive sins. We got to go to Him to forgive, get forgiveness. We can't forgive ourselves for the sins we've committed. There's some ways and some things you can forgive yourself about. You can, you can release yourself after He has and say, you know what? I, I just cannot live with that, that guilt forever. I, I mean, I'm sorry that I did those things, but you know what? I'm, I, I'm, I'm releasing myself now because Christ has released me so I can be free. But friend, that follows his forgiveness, not just because you decided, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to forget that. No. Vehement desire to be righteous. I want to be righteous before God. I want to have right standing before God. That's my greatest desire. You have that kind of, you have that vehement desire to be righteous, and uh, it'll help keep you from falling into temptation. When that temptation begins to come your way, this desire steps forward in your life. Says, I don't want to sin. I don't want to go back there. Amen. The zeal, he goes on to say, what zeal, what revenge, zeal to do right, to work for God, zeal to be the person God's called you to be. I want to be that kind of person. I, I want to do that kind of thing. I don't want to be in and out. I want to be, I want to be true blue. Amen. What revenge. Amen. I, I'm, I'm literally, uh, it's kind of a, a, a unique word there, but it talks about the sense of giving justice, amen, to all and, 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 and even wanting to, you know, punish sin if we can. Not only giving it no place in your life, but saying, you know what, I'm, I am, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be against it so much that sin knows I, it has an obstacle in me. I, I'm, I'm going to punch this thing. I'm going to fight this thing. I, I, I'm tired of it having any kind of uh, free course in my life. Amen. Revenge, taking revenge even uh, against the sins that you have committed in your life. Amen. By, by trying to re, uh, undo the things that you did as best you can. Mark 2.17, uh, the word of the Lord says, I come not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Amen. That's the, uh, all of them were sinners, but they thought they were righteous. But the Lord said, I, I'm, I'm not here to try to to, to, to uh, make you that feel righteous think that, uh, you know, you're getting an easy way out here. I'm calling sinners to repentance. Luke 13 and 3, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise, what? Perish. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Friend, there are perishing people all around us. They're perishing in their sin when we have this glorious message of repentance. Acts 17 and 30. Now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Amen. Amen. There's a command. At the times of ignorance, God winked at. There was a period of time in the Old Testament 
where God just kind of allowed the people to do what they did because of the hardness of their heart. It's like he winked at it, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It's a command of God to repent. Hallelujah. Amen. It's not optional. It's an essential part of one's experience. Let's look at baptism for a little bit here. Amen. For the remaining moments we have of, of our time together in this class. Baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo uh, originated in the industry of dyeing cloth. When they would take cloth and they would say, I want it to be this color, I want it to be that color, they would immerse it in that dye and it would um, then be so uh, uh, consumed with the color that uh, every part of it uh, that had come in contact with the dye was now changed. It was saturated. It was immersed. And uh, so when we, when we understand the, to be baptized, we see that immersion is the only way to be baptized. Amen. Um, we, we know that baptism is for the remission of our sin. Amen. Luke 24, 47. Luke 24, 47. Jesus prophesied that repentance and remission of sin would be preached in His name. All right? See that? Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So baptism, which is for the remission or the removal of sin, is preached in His name. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 38. We see Jerusalem here in view. Uh, it's 33 AD. It's the day of Pentecost. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit has just happened. The 120 believers have spilled out into the courtyard. People have come from all over the city that were there for the feast of Pentecost, hearing all the commotion. Then Peter rises up, preached to them about what is being fulfilled in their very eyes and ears. And uh, the Bible says he declared Jesus uh, um, being the Savior of the world that they crucified. Um, and, uh, uh, but now he resurrected and sent forth the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the people were pricked in their hearts, verse number 37. And they called out and said, well, what are we going to do about this? Our sin is so great. How do we get this sin taken care of? And it's repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remission means to remove a stain. And the only way to get that sin removed from us is by baptism. Amen. Acts 22 and 16 tells us baptism is for the washing away of our sin. Now why tarry us? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Amen. That's the process right there. That's not a, it's not something we get baptized and then somehow later we wash our sins away. How can we wash our sins away? It's the baptism, amen, that causes us to have our sins washed away. John 3 and 5, amen. Baptism is part of the new birth. Remember when Jesus came to Nicodemus and he told Nicodemus, who was a religious ruler, he said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Truly, truly, I say unto you. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, how do I get born again? Of the water, which is water baptism, and of the Spirit, which is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Baptism, according to 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21, is a purging and a cleansing. A purging and a cleansing of our conscience. Everyone say conscience. Amen. Look at that. Which sometimes were disobedient, speaking of us, when the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. The ark was preparing. That ark was for the saving of everybody, but only eight souls were saved by water. That uh, There in verse number 20, then verse number 21, it goes on to relay that same type of salvation. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth now also save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, not taking a bath, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. When you have repented, you remember we said it's a change of mind. 
You are saying, I want something new. I want a, I want a new life. I want to leave the past. I, 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 want to, I want to have a new life, new direction. And um, your conscience still is heavily uh, messed up by the sins. But yet now you're making a new start. And this is the answer of a good can- a conscience toward God. It can clear your conscience. It can help you have a restful conscience, knowing, okay, I, I have been baptized now. My sins are removed from me. I'm not going to stand in judgment for that sin that I committed or those many, many, many sins. Amen. Because the only way to get rid of them is by repentance and water baptism in Jesus' name. And I have done that. So before God, who is the judge, I am now clear in my conscience. Amen. Baptism is a type of burial in Romans chapter number 6, verses 3 and 4. The word of the Lord says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, amen, that's how we get into Christ. We must get into Christ through baptism. We did so by, amen, His death. And then goes on to say, For we are buried with Him as He was buried. Now we are buried with Him by baptism, into death. That's how we have died to sin. That's how we died to the, the, the old nature. Amen. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 27 lets us know that baptism is a putting on or taking unto ourselves of the name of Jesus. This is how we get the name applied. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Hallelujah. You you are now clothed, as it were. Amen. With Christ. We have taken him upon our self. Praise God. So, uh, does the the Bible teach uh, how one to be baptized? Well, we just saw that the word baptizo there means to be fully immersed. So, what about Sprinkling, how did that come about? Well, sprinkling kind of came about through the Catholic practice uh, of those days, which then they had adopted from many different types of pagan, um, various pagan baptisms that uh, was adopted into uh, what became known as the Catholic Church back in 300 A.D. and other uh, remaining years after that. And so uh, we, we understand that uh, when one is, is, is desiring to be baptized, uh, as the apostolic church baptized and has always baptized since since the uh, the days of Pentecost, um, the Jews had what they called their mikvah baths. Maybe you've heard of that. Mikvah bath was a pool of water uh, that they would go down into and immerse themselves completely under and come out of that water uh, with the sense of now I am uh, ritualistically clean. This was a ceremonial thing that they did in response to the Old Testament law. When they, when they were filthy, um, that's how they cleansed themselves, by this bath. And, uh, well, then John the Baptist and Jesus and all the others uh, that came preaching this, they alluded to that, not as just getting the filth of the flesh or a ceremonial thing taken care of, but now as for remission of sin. Amen. And um, so we, we see here, that uh, they would go down into the water, amen, and uh, they would come out of the water. Now, uh, Martin Luther, Martin Luther was a Catholic that became uh, the the founder of Lutheran, which was the first Protestant um, uh, Protestant denomination. He was the father of the Protestant Reformation. He had this to say. Uh, Martin Luther said, baptism is a Greek word, and it is translated immerse. And he goes on to say, I would have those that are to be baptized to be altogether dipped. I want them to be altogether dipped. That was how Martin Luther began the Lutheran church, by baptizing people by immersion. Well, it wasn't long before they changed the practice. A Catholic theologian by the name of Brenner said that for the first 1,300 years of the New Testament church, from the time of Christ all the way up even into the 1,300s, he said, All of us practice baptism by immersion, by putting the person underwater. And uh, so uh, it was the common practice there. Uh, Matthew chapter number 3, verse number 16, when Jesus was baptized, 
And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. He saw the Spirit of God. He was in the water. John baptized him. John didn't want to do it, but Jesus said it's to fulfill all righteousness. They dipped him in the river Jordan. He came up straightway out of the water. Acts 8.38, Philip baptized an Ethiopian eunuch, and uh, this Ethiopian eunuch uh, was uh, uh, riding in a chariot, and uh, Philip preached to him, and they saw a pool of water. The Ethiopian eunuch commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, Philip, baptized him. Amen. And uh, so uh, they were together there in the water. It would not be necessary if it was just sprinkling. I'm sure they had a canteen somewhere in uh, the chariot that they could have just sprinkled some water on him. But they stopped upon the command of the Ethiopian eunuch who understood from the preaching of Philip that he needed to be baptized and the practice of baptism was by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Well, amen. I feel like I have flown as fast as I can fly uh, and we're, we're, uh, we've got so much more to, to share. But uh, as you know, our desire is to have Sunday school from 10 to 1045 and it's a little after that now. Uh, I want you to stand together with me if you would. Take, take um, a moment here with me to pray. And then after we get done praying, if you want to take a minute to, uh, to step out or, or whatever, then Brother Kidder is going to uh, come to the pulpit and begin to lead us in prayer till 11 o'clock. But let's thank the Lord for his word today. Thank you, Lord God, for helping us understand your grace, your mercy, repentance. And now, Lord, uh, a little bit more about water baptism. And we just thank you for water baptism. And, Lord, we thank you that our sins have been washed away. And we pray, God, that this helps all of us to become even more understanding of this glorious doctrine of the church. Amen. And how to put it, uh, this principle of baptism, into practice. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Praise God.